Happy New Year to everybody here. Dave and Tiff back with you on the Dave and Tiff Sports Podcast. Our first uh, episode for 2021. We both, uh, Tiff and I, survived the New Year's and the Christmas celebrations and all of that. And we're excited to have our first episode here of the new year. And our special guest will be former University of Hawaii assistant coach, now with Nick Rolovich over in Washington State, Craig Stutzman. And I got to think, you know, we'll, I'll ask the question about how proud he is of all the St. Louis alums all over the place. Even his starting quarterback over at Washington State, Jaden Delora, is a uh, great freshman year he had out of St. Louis. Mariota, Tango Vailoa, Chevin Cordero, the starter at Hawaii. So St. Louis, their presence is felt in football and representing um, the 58th state. But, you know, Tiff, one of the things that happened over the weekend, um, the playoffs. And I like the fact, I mean, a football fan, three games each on Saturday and Sunday because of the new NFL format. If you're a football fan, football lovers, I mean, that was great from morning till early evening of football. And if you could get away with it without having to do any chores or <laughs> anything else, that was awesome. Oh, definitely. And the fact that if you, especially out here in Hawaii, where the early games start off at 8 o'clock. Now, is that a little too early? Heck no, because when it's a six-hour time difference from the East Coast, it's normally starting at 7. So having football at 8 and going till about 6, 6.30 at night, it's, it's, a, be- it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> I know, I tell you. And, you know, my kids are older, so they can take care of themselves. They don't need me. I could sit. I could lounge, I could watch, I could have a beverage, I could snack here and there. The game that naturally caught my attention, and maybe because it was just yesterday, but the upset of the weekend, I would have to say, and I think most people are saying is the Browns over the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, the narrative... Not your Rams? Not your Rams? No, no, no. no. We'll get to the Rams later, you know. But but in terms of the upset, when you think about what, how the seedings were, what was going on going into the game, the whole thing about the Browns not having Kevin Stefanski as their head coach, and I believe it was two other coaches and four players missing because of COVID-19 protocols. So the head coach not there, who's the offensive play caller. You're playing in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, although sluggish in the last six games of the season, still, you know, 12-5 and going into the – excuse me, I think 12 and four going into the final. Mm-hmm. Anyway, they had a win, you know, a, a good season for them. And then that first quarter, I mean, I was stunned when on the first snap of the game by a pro bowl center over your head into the end zone, recovered by Cleveland for a touchdown. I mean, was that the game that kind of caught your eye over the whole weekend? Just bat it through the end zone, give up the two points and then get the free kick to kick it off. What are you trying to do recovering it at the one-yard line? It, it's, it's befuddling because I'm not a football guy. You're not really a football guy, but we keep hearing, and we might even ask Coach Stutzman this, if, if, you're an, if you're an offensive lineman or a defensive guy, as much as you would love to scoop and score, just fall on the ball. Give yourself, give your team another down to play. But like you said, it's seven seven nothing, all twenty eight nothing. Most points scored in a quarter in a playoff game in, in history. It was it was practically over, and, and the fact that the Browns didn't have any sort of practicing until the Friday before the game, and like you said, their head coach he was stuck in their basement, <laughs> and the and the fact that he was basically watching the game on like a minute delay from his family upstairs, and he knew that that first touchdown was scored about a minute or so after because he was hearing his kids and his wife all cheering from right. upstairs. He's in his basement wondering what the heck just happened. And then he's on a delay, which we all love. And the Browns oh. figure out a way. Go figure. That was the – outside of the Colts and Bills game, to me, the Browns win that game. I feel bad for Chris Hart. I feel bad for all the Steeler fans out there because there are a lot of them on the island. What a game by the Brownies. Yeah, you know, turnovers, uh, Roethlisberger with four turnovers, three in the first half. Um, and getting back to that very first play, right, the snap, the ball is rolling, and I believe it was Roethlisberger and Connor, the running back, who were two of them right there on the one-yard line. They could have just pounced on the ball. But it almost looked like they didn't know which one of them was going to jump on it. And there was a little bit of a hesitation. 
which led to, you know, the Browns recovering it. I mean, Roethlisberger, he looked all of 39, even going on 50, trying to go after that ball. He kind of stumbled over to it, and he looked over like, oh, should I bend down and risk my knees or whatever? Um, there is a knee-jerk reaction now, obviously, because with Pittsburgh losing so bad and the way they slid toward the end of the season about will Ben Roethlisberger retire? Should they really move in a different direction? Um, there's a lot of key players like Juju Smith-Schuster who are free agents. And there's this little, little element of panic. But I kind of think, you know, I don't know if – and Pittsburgh is not a team, an organization that panics. So I'm thinking there's no real sense for them to panic. I mean, that – playoff game was an anomaly mistakes will doom you and those kind of mistakes that happen in that first quarter are not normal so I don't know I don't think Pittsburgh should be in a panic right now you're at home you started the season 11 and 0 and like you said 12 and 4 they won the division got the home playoff game in the wild card round and you, you go you go one in four the rest of the way after that 11 and 11 and 0 start. And like you said, Roethlisberger under contract for one more year, 22 and a quarter million dollar prorated, prorated uh, contract for the, for this next season. Josh Dobbs, Mason Rudolph are your only other quarterbacks on the roster. Do you dump the contract before the league year starts in, in sometime in March? Because in, in a couple of days into the 2021 NFL season he's guaranteed about 19 million dollars as a roster bonus so he's going to cost he's going to cost the team a little over 41 million dollars next year which is roughly about 20 22 23 percent of Pittsburgh's projected salary cap for 21 that's a lot of money for a 40 year old quarterback yeah I'm sure that's going to be one of the big sticking points as to how the offseason will go the financial element of it and how the, if Pittsburgh wants to move forward in terms of re-signing the free agents. Do they support the run game if Roethlisberger is the quarterback next year? Because he cannot be 32-year-old Ben Roethlisberger. He's going to be 40-year-old Ben Roethlisberger, and they have to compensate their offense for that. Sticking with I also, football. I also, oh, go I, also, ahead. I, also, I also think, Dave, that you, you mentioned, is it time to panic? Uh, I think after what the AFC North did this past weekend, Baltimore got a very nice win in Tennessee. Of course, the Browns beat Pittsburgh, it, it beat the Steelers, beat, beat their divisional rival. The fact that two of the four AFC North teams are in the AFC divisional round, the mm -hmm. Bengals, well, you just hope that Joe Burrow gets better for, for next season. You know the Bengals are going to be the worst team in the AFC North. Sorry, Eric Matthews. It's basically a three-team race in the AFC North. But you look at how the AFC North has done this season, to me, if you're the Steelers, you have to figure out something pretty quick because it could come in 2021 where you're, you're already going to be playing a top schedule for the next season based on the fact that you were the AFC North champs. I, th I think with what Baltimore has shown, they could upset Buffalo this weekend. Sure, the Browns have to go to KC and a lot of, a lot of odds makers are picking the Chiefs to win pretty big. But I think from what we have seen in the playoffs from this division, if you're, if you're a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, I think it might be time to start panicking just a little bit. You mentioned some of the favorites. Obviously, the Chiefs, as of today, nine-and-a-half-point favorites over the Browns. Bills, two-and-a-half-point favorite over the Ravens. My Rams, by the way, seven-point underdogs to Green Bay, and they have – Obviously, quarterback issues, inconsistent play by Jared Goff. His thumb is not totally healed. Who knows if um, Wolfert will be available after that hit that he took in the head yesterday. They said he was okay, but will he be available? Or will he have to um, you know, go a different route? So that's a big question mark there against a great Green Bay team. And they're going to play in the freezing cold of the frozen tundra and Lambeau and the other playoff Tampa Bay at New Orleans and the two oldest quarterbacks going on there. So it's going to be another fun weekend um, next week. Um, sticking with football today, as we make this recording is the college football national championship, Alabama versus Ohio state. Now leading up to this day had been these rumors and these speculations and behind the scenes talks of 
postponement because Ohio State was at the brink or on the verge of, you know, having COVID-19 issues with players and so forth and so on. It's obviously scheduled, so they're playing, but there was a lot of talk to that. Irregardless of the fact that it is scheduled, was there any point last week that you kind of thought, you know what, maybe the game should be postponed because the argument on Ohio State was some of the starters weren't, weren't going to be able to play and it would allow them to be at full strength and you'd have two teams at full strength playing against each other. Would you have, would you have kind of lobbied maybe for postponement or would you say, hey, play on if you got enough eligible players, play on? Uh, you know, I, th- I think Ohio State lobbied enough to, to the Big Ten Conference to have them play fewer than the required minimum games at first to make and be eligible for the Big Ten Conference title game. Were they playing possum? Was it a smoke screen? Was it to throw some shade at Alabama and say, hmm, who, who's going to be available, who's not going to be available? I, I don't know. I, th- I think – I think they, they knew all along that they were going to be able to find a way to have the, the, the number of guys that they needed to be eligible for that game. And the guys that are the most important to the Buckeye squad were going to be healthy and available for tonight's college football playoff national championship game. Now, who knows how Justin Fields is feeling after, after – is, how is he feeling after all those broken ribs – Oh, that, that's so painful just, just thinking about it. How's he going to feel? How's he going to be able to move out of the pocket? And that's, that's another underlying story there. I mean, they're saying, well, the whole talk was, yeah, we, we're on the, brink, on the brink of, you know, not having enough eligible scholarship players. But really, were they trying to get more time for Justin Fields to heal? Like you said, he was injured in the, in the playoff game. And if there's one player that you want to have at, as close to 100% as possible in a national championship game, it's your QB. So personally, I feel like, hey, both teams are given the rules on the COVID protocols. If you got enough scholarship players, you play, regardless of what your starting lineup is and blah, blah, blah. They're both equal to that. And I, also, and I kind of lean in support of Alabama. They played more games. Ohio State is only seven games played. So that is, to me, a physical advantage to them. Hey, you got what you got. Your backups are still four and five blue chip recruits too. So let's play on. So as it is, the game is going to be played on. Who do you think is going to win? Bama. Roll Tide. Big? Blowout? I'm I'm not not one to throw any sort of – coin or cash towards the point spread will leave those to those that you know are under contracts and make a little bit more money than both of us combined uh <laughs> I, you know it, it, you're, there are gonna be a lot of points scored and i think that over under which was around 74 75 uh one oh. of the bigger over unders out there in, in recent history i think that's going to be coming into play near the end of the game and there could be a significant player too to some We'll, we'll just leave it at that. But uh, I, I got the SEC champs. I got the Heisman Trophy favorite, uh, the winner, rather, in Devontae Smith and Mac Jones and Najee Harris, who that was a travesty that he was even fin- that he even finished fifth in the Heisman Trophy poll. He should have been higher, and it's not Bama's fault that they have three of the top players in the country. Uh, I got roll tied over the Buckeyes. Yeah, I think the talent is just going to prevail there in this game. So uh, I just hope it's, uh, you know, competitive and – you know, we'll see what we get. By the way, later on in our podcast, we will have one of our features we call Aladdin's Lamp. Just like the story goes, we have three wishes. Although for our format, we have four options to pick and we will pick three of these. We don't know what is behind wish number one, two, three, or four. We'll pick three of them and then we'll see what our wish is based on that. Craig Sussman is going to be our guest today, assistant coach with Washington State. The word on the street regarding health is hydrate, so why not get some other benefits too? The new word is live, spelled L-I-V. So get out and live life well with products and systems made with new technology that you simply add to or take with water. You hydrate? 
lose weight, cleanse your system, gain energy, and it is all natural. Go to mylivezone.com backslash D-A-P. Live, L-I-V, zone.com backslash D-A-P. Well, we're lucky here to be joined by former Hawaii assistant coach in football, former St. Louis great, as well as a former University of Hawaii great player, Craig Stutzman, all the way from Pullman, Washington. And Coach, first of all, thanks for joining us. And I, we talked just before you came on. It's a very brisk 38 degrees, is it not, in Pullman? Yeah. First off, thanks for having me on. Um, it is cold out right now. It's about 38 <laughs> degrees out. Um, but, you know, once you're here for a couple of months, you kind of get used to it. Although I still got my slippers on, you know, I always say I don't take those slippers off until uh, the snow gets over the lip of my slippers. So I'm 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 holding out pretty strong right now. So you actually walk outdoors when it's snowing with slippers? Any oh yeah, I got I got it on right now. Oh, any of the is that a a a, a show of toughness for the players? Like, dudes, if you guys want to grumble about being cold, look at Coach Stutzman. I got slippers on. I know like a couple of the players had kind of mentioned to each other. I know a couple of the quarterbacks said, hey, coach, they said, man, you really are Hawaiian. You wear slippers all the time. And I'm like, yeah, but I didn't do it as a sign of toughness. It's just comfort. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, the thing is when it's cold out, you're not going to be out there for a long time unless you're coaching. And if you're coaching, then you got your shoes or coaching gear. The, the trick is, you know, you get in your truck when it's already warm. Then you get into the building that's already warm. So the cold doesn't really bother you too much. I wanted to ask you this, um, this, you just, you just completed your first year, first season. Right. What was more challenging having to adjust to a new school, new players, new environment, or having to adjust coaching under this pandemic situation where that's totally different. It threw your schedule all the way off, which was more challenging to kind of get adjusted to? Um, you know, that's a good question because I would say it's it's equal. I mean, some days where you don't really feel the pandemic as much because you kind of you get into a routine, right? You, you get up really early in the morning, you have your players test, uh, then you have meetings and, and then they go to school and then you come back in the afternoon. It did change our schedule, the way that we like to do things. And the rollout, you know, we've always practiced in the morning. So that was a little bit of a trick in itself. Um, but then but then some days, you know, all of a sudden you have like 10 players that might be out. Well, how does that adjust your schedule for the day? And then ultimately there's been a few times that, you know, we got pulled off the field about an hour before kickoff or hour and a half before kickoff. Um, another time we're getting on the bus to go to Stanford um, and we get pulled off the buses. So, um, you know, I think the mental toughness, conditioning, fortitude, to uh, stay within yourself and understand that, you know, you can, I mean, this at its core is, is really teaching and molding young men to understand you only can control what you can control, you know, and I know it sounds crazy, but in the craziness of the, the pandemic, it's, you know, how do you treat your body? How do you prepare for games? And are you ready when the time comes, whether it's practice, whether it's film room, whether it's game time ultimately. And so, um, you know, it's one of those things. And, and as coaches, you got to practice how you preach. The other thing too, like you said, being able to teach obviously through Zoom is not the ideal situation, um, but everybody had to do it. You know, everybody had to overcome it from the NFL all the way down to high schools. Uh, the trick is though different states has different COVID protocols, you know, so uh, some states, some schools, some programs might have an advantage of that. But at the same time too, though, you know, we're all, we're all dealing with it in some way, shape or form. And it, it was, it was challenging. Um, I know it was challenging for the players. Imagine being 18 years old, you know, if you're not from Pullman, all of a sudden you're thrust into a season or a condensed season with not a real off season to prepare your bodies and your minds. We got a new, uh, a new scheme, a new offense, a new defense, special teams. Um, we're still trying to get to know one another, build trust, you know, and, and to build trust when there's outside forces telling you, no, wait, you can't do that. You got to kind of toe the line because you can't make promises that ultimately is not your decision as a coach or as players. Um, but this year, more than any, it seemed to take care of the mental health of the players and keep them engaged and keep them positive and uh, try to, you know, preach to them that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Coach, we talked about the weather and the fact that you said it was around 30 or so today. Who's got the better, how, how are your, I guess, skills at putting chains on your tires? Is yours better or is Coach Rolo's better? 
<laughs> uh, we both bought big trucks, <laughs> four wheel drive, big trucks. So, uh, you know, we don't have to put the chains of the tires, but it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, coach Rolo has kind of that, um, wild man type country type, <laughs> you know, he, he's the one that wore boots to practice every day. He still does. Right. He's got, you know, the, the camouflage stuff. So I think he's probably a little bit more well equipped to handle the weather than me. Um, if we're st stranded on a deserted Island, I'd, I'd probably be able to help him out a little bit more. <laughs> you talked about, uh, you know, part of the season, the fact that, you know, some games got canceled, the fact that you guys were on the bus and then you had to get taken off the bus, you know, an hour, hour or so before uh, you guys, you know, we're going to depart to play a game. To not play the Apple Cup this year, how disappointed were the fans in, in Pullman to not get that chance to win the Apple Cup? Yeah, you know, it's it's weird because, right, you guys are going through it too in Hawaii. The shutdown, uh, we really don't interact as much, but you look through social media and you can see the frustration, the disappointment in it. I can tell you right now, the week before the game, uh, they're putting the Apple Cup logo on our stadium and all of our coaches' office looks down right into the field. And, you know, they're prepping that game and, and they're trying to say whatever we can do to get that game done because it's, it's such a, you know, a great thing for the, the student and athlete to experience. Uh, you know, from the moment we got the job here, it was all about the Apple Cup and, and you know, how exciting that is for you. And, wow, you know, Jason Gesser, uh, my best friend, calls me up and says, hey, listen, the Apple Cup is like no other. You know, go, go ahead and, and really get dialed in for that one. Uh, for us not to play it. I know it was really disappointing for everybody involved in the Washington State community, um, you know, the Wazoo Coot Nation. And, and uh, but, you know, it's, I think what happened though, a lot of people understand what was going through or going on in the pandemic. And they were more supportive of just making sure that we are okay with the players and making sure, hey, no matter what, we support you guys. Um, there is always going to be the next Apple Cup. But, you know, this team, you got to take care of this 2020 team and get them ready for 2021 because we're dealing with people, right? We're not just dealing with the game. We're dealing with people. And that's the most important thing. One of the cool things, especially for Saturdays in the fall, we know it's going to be college football is the fact that ESPN does a lot of game days and, and they have, you know, whether, you know, fans are there or different, you know, paraphernalia of their favorite teams are there. One of the things that really sticks out every single week, uh, what you guys call old crimson, Yes. To you and to the staff, as well as to everybody around Coug Nation, what does it mean when you guys flip it on ESPN every morning and you see Old Crimson flying in the background? It just goes to show you the type of support and how important uh, you know college football and, and the Washington State Cougars is to not just Pullman, but everybody who has come through Pullman, who has come through Washington State. Um, you know, when, like you said, it doesn't matter when you flip it on and you see that big pole and that flag and Oak Crimson's flying and you're like, yep, it's game day. It's ready to go. And it's, it's special. It's something that, you know, nobody else can say they, they do. And, um, and it's kind of like, you know, we tell the quarterbacks, I tell the quarterbacks all the time. The first thing you flip on Saturday morning is college game day. Right. And when you see Oak Crimson flying, you better believe you better get your butts up because it's going down today and you got to represent because that flag has traveled, you know, for years and to every college game day site. I mean, just the love and support and passion for Washington State football. I mean, there's nothing else like it, I think. Another guy from your alma mater, Jaden Delore, had, had a pretty good season this past year, and he's going to have somebody that's going to work with him coming over from the SEC, uh, Tennessee grad transfer, Jared Giorantano. What do you like about him, and how can you feel those two will complement each other? Right. Um, you know, Jared has a lot of experience. Uh, he's played at the highest level in, in college football in the SEC, um, in the Power Five. He's going to be able to show, you know, Jaden and, and all the other quarterbacks in the room you know, what it takes day in and day out to be consistent, to approach the game like a pro. Um, because when you're playing quarterback, it's different. It's a different deal. You know, you got to build trust and you got to build consistency with your team. Um, and, and before we got here, before the start of this first game against uh, Oregon State, there hasn't been one, there wasn't one quarterback that's taken a Division One college snap in the quarterback room at Washington State when we came here. So, you know, it was kind of thrown into the mix, thrown into the fire. And, um, it, there wasn't, you know, we need peer to peer leadership as well. You know, it's one thing when a coach or a parent's telling you to do something over and over, but when your brother or your buddy tells you, Hey, let's do this. 
da 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 and there's a peer-to-peer -peer leadership. That's a whole nother level. So I'm excited for Jared uh, to come in and bring that. I'm excited to see the competition that it sparks between all the guys in the room. And, you know, it's like Rollo says, you know, it's, it's sharpens in the, you know, iron's in the sharpen iron. And, um, you know, both guys will step up and, and really looking for all five or six guys in the quarterback room to step up. We got a true freshman from um, California, you know, Xavier Ward, who's, who's really talented too. And the other two guys are three guys that's already been in the room. So, um, you know, I think, and, and the fit is right. Jared, we did our, our homework on him, um, had a lot of conversations with him and his family and, and guys that has coached him in the past. Um, you know, we were going to bring any old person that played in the SEC or, or, you know, being that he's a one for one guy was, was important to us because we believe in our young guys, but at the same time too, to bring some maturity and some also experience into the room, I think is invaluable. Hey coach, uh, Craig Stussman here joining us, uh, assistant coach. Co Let me see if I got all the titles here. Co-offensive <laughs> coordinator, quarterbacks coach for Washington State. Did I get it all right? Right, good. Cool. Okay. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to ask you something that totally doesn't do with quarterbacks because I always wanted to find out mm -hmm. the difference between the slot receiver and the right. wide out. You were a slot receiver as a player. You run the offense mm -hmm. uh, with Washington State. What are the physical differences in terms of when you look at a player is there between one that you say this should be a slot receiver or this guy should be mm -hmm. a, a wide? Um, I think there is distinct differences in the run and shoot and especially our style of the run and shoot with our RPOs. We are looking for explosive, compact players that has elite quickness and change of direction. Um, linear speed is, you know, probably third on the list. Uh, being able to feel space and understand, um, you know, body position. And it's like being a basketball player, point guard, trying to weave through traffic, you know, and, and, and really be able to see um, really the field from a quarterback's perspective, uh, you know, being able to see from corner to corner and then everything in between it. As a wide receiver, you know, we're looking for guys that are a little bit more length or linear speed um, and guys that – you know, may not have the, the best feel for, you know, space, but guys that can just run and really go ahead and take that one-on-one -on -one matchup or that corner. Because when you're playing wide out, you're either going to have, you know, some kind of zone defense. At some point, that zone defense turns into man. And, and really, it's whether it's a cover two safety coming over the top and you're going vertical, you know, can you out jump that guy? Can you big body that guy? Can you run past him? Uh, whether it's a corner on the cover three, can you still get on top of the guy or are you going to threaten him deep and sit it down? That really comes to your linear speed. Uh, so those are some little differences that we're looking for. Ideally, you like to get four guys that could do <laughs> both, like a Devontae Smith. But, um, you know, we got some guys here at Washington State that have the ability to play both. And we're looking at possibly moving some guys in or moving some guys out and, and using some of uh, their athleticism that way. Hey, final question, Coach. Uh, Craig Sussman, glad he could join us here today. Your office looks extremely neat and organized behind you. Is that kind of the atmosphere? Is that <laughs> yeah. you? Is Coach, is Coach Stutzman very neat and organized? Um, <laughs> I think anybody that truly knows me knows that uh, from when I was younger to now, it's a world of difference. The biggest thing <laughs> for here is that, you know, you're a coach, right? And you have young men that look up to you and you're teaching them, hey, you're teaching them how to be clean, how to be organized, especially coaching quarterbacks has kind of put my mentality in a different way of, you know, organization, understanding the bigger picture and perception, sometimes perception is reality and all those things. But at the same time, too, though, I think being able to kind of get my life a little bit more organized allows me to be more efficient. One thing that I pride myself on is putting being efficient at the core of my belief. So if that means keeping it clean and neat, that's cool. But the other thing too now is we have these big picture windows from the hallway that come into our office. And the other side is big picture windows that go right into the stadium. There's no blinds. So if oh. Coach Rolla walks down or Athletic Director <laughs> Pat Chen walks out, this better be clean. So <laughs> that, that's your answer right there. My wife came in with my brother and my sister-in-law. They came to visit. Oh. Uh, my, my brother and my sister, Billy Ray and, and Chanel came in. And my wife even came through and she goes, I haven't been here for a while. It's really clean in here. And my brother said, like, unbelievable. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, got to be, once the curtain's up, you got to be ready to show, right? I guess that's. Exactly, exactly.
But it, hey, it that, that stadium behind Tiff, that looks clean. It looks really right. clean. Yeah, you I wait love till it. it gets back to when you can have fans again and be all loud and rowdy. I mean, we just can't wait for that for all of college football. To have. Oh, final question, Coach. Who's your pick in the national championship game tonight? Um, I mean, Alabama looks pretty tough offensively. It's probably one of the most proficient offenses ever in the history of college football. Um, but I will say this, though, something about Ohio State, they just they look like they're, they're nitty, they're gritty, they're tough. You know, how they put it down on Clemson, how they play it on defense. Um, just, I don't know, it's just, you know, sometimes you're just, you get a weird feeling. I think Alabama wins, but I don't know. I get a weird feeling for Ohio State. I, but but if I'm if I'm putting on my last penny that I own on something, it's going to be on Alabama. You, you got to play the percentages, right? True, true. Who are you guys picking? Alabama. I got Bama. It's, it's a sweep <laughs> hey, here. Hey, don't play for them no more now. <laughs> no, it does not. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Coach, thanks so much for taking some time. Stay warm out there, and we look forward to next year's season. Hopefully everything's back to normal. But thanks, Coach, for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Award-winning Hawaii sports writer Cindy Lewis shares her love of volleyball and other sports topics with her new website, CindyLewis.com. After nearly 40 years of covering the top events in Hawaii, Cindy brings her reporting flair and insight to the digital format for all to enjoy. Get the very latest information on University of Hawaii volleyball for all teams, women, men, and beach, from one of the most respected journalists in the state. Go to CindyLewis.com and you will be connected. Over 30 years of experience of covering Hawaii sports and telling stories can be found with BedrockSportsHawaii.com. Hawaii sports writer Nick Abramo shares his passion for insight, news, and opinions, along with stories and tales in what he calls the inexhaustible universe of athletics. Football, surfing, hockey, yes, hockey, and wrestling are some of the featured content you will find on BedrockSportsHawaii.com. Right, this is a special segment we like to do called Aladdin's Lamp. So here it is. Like Aladdin, you have three wishes. You rub the lamp. We're rubbing our lamp here virtually here, and we're going to pick three wishes. There's four available wishes. We don't know what's behind each of them. So Tiff, you get to pick wish number one, two, three, or four, and we end up with three of them. So which one do you want? I will start with number three. Number three. All right. This is an NBA question here. With the COVID postponements, injuries, and stars doing load management, do you wish the NBA started later? No, I don't. And the fact that they started right before Christmas, everybody knew that the protocols are gonna be in place. It was gonna be a lot different than it was uh, back in Florida with the bubble throughout the summer and into the early part of of September into 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 October as well. Everybody knew what was expected of them to stay safe, to be tested, to do whatever they needed to do to stay healthy and to test negative so that they could play. So no, I don't think the NBA should have delayed the start of their season. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, hey, set the date. You got to do what you got to do. Um, okay, my choice, I'm going to go with number Four. Okay, college basketball. The men's NCAA tournament will be in one location, Indianapolis. Do you wish it could still be at regional sites? You know, I'm gonna, I kind of wish it was at regional sites and not so much because of the fans because there probably won't be any fans. But I think considering the pandemic and so many cities around the country need some economic revitalization, you know, teams coming in, hotels, restaurants. I mean, if anything, that could have helped in that way. So, and of course, every city is always proud to host a regional. There's a little bit of that pride, a little bit of that positivity. I mean, to me, the Indianapolis bubble, I think is the best sit a solution to do, and I'm glad they did it. But if they could have, I would have gone for the regional. How about you? I, I, I like the idea of having it in one site, like you said, with a bubble and the fact that the city of Indianapolis with, with, between hotels and, and playing venues, they, they have the capability. I think it would have been pretty cool if they could have done a north, south, east and west bubble and have 
16 teams per bubble and then the winner of each bubble moves to a new bubble for the final four location and have that be of a situation i like the idea of what they what they're doing with selling the naming rights to different parts of the bracket so that they can start to recoup some of that money that was lost uh when the 2020 tournament uh was canceled because because of the pandemic i i, I like the idea though of, of bubbling in in one location yeah okay you get the final wish there's either wish number one or number two for the final wish two number two an NFL question. Is there an underdog team in the playoffs that you wish to make it to the Super Bowl? Uh, we talked about them earlier. Cleveland Browns. They didn't make the playoffs since 2002. Got their first road win since, what, 1969? Their first playoff victory since 94. I, I think for everything that that city has gone through, and yes, the Cavaliers won the title for the first time a couple of years ago. I, I think I think the feel good story, if it's not the Buffalo Bills, would be the Cleveland Browns. Yeah, so they are. I think they're the, a good sentimental favorite. I, I'm a Rams fan, so I'm going to root for the Rams. Yeah, we know. You know, with their quarterback situation, but in terms of a story, I think the Cleveland Browns story is the best if they continue that is the ultimate cinderella story for the nfl playoffs all right well that'll do it man we got a good aladdin's lap I want to thank craig stutzman for joining us here today we'll be back for another episode we're going to publish it next week on the dave and tiff sports podcast we hope rainbow whiny basketball will get back in here this weekend they've had two weekends of covid 19 issues derailing their games they'll be on the road in bakersville we hope that'll be a game they'll actually get to play. So until our next episode, and hopefully we'll have some games to say they all played this next weekend, we'll see you next time. And Tiff, our final message. Stay safe and wear that mask. Be socially distant. Take care, everybody. <laughs>